interesting uh, speaker to you, Nives Rombini. She started her career with Swisscom, where she was a trainee data analyst who worked on various projects. She had an opportunity to join a Swiss team worked, uh, working on automating financial, financial data planning after her training. She moved to pharmaceutical industry because she was concerned about healthcare and wanted to use her skills in data analysis to further research and development projects. She combined her biology expertise and data analytic abilities with her master's degree in molecular life science. She currently works as a senior scientist at BMS with a lot of experience in data science and immunology. We are pleased to welcome her today. Nives, stage is yours. Thank you so much. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I was talking before with the technician saying that I'm half Italian, so I need a lot of space to move on the stage. Um, but I wanted just to start sharing uh, something I was doing last weekend. So I spent the weekend skiing. The conditions were not that great, but I had time to think about a use case or an example how I can bring you this topic a little bit closer. So. Imagine a case where you are skiing and unfortunately you hurt your knee, you need to go to the hospital and the physicians tell you that you should get some imaging done because your knee indeed doesn't look that great. Um, so you get your images and then the physicians tell you that it's better, thank you, it's better um, if you get a surgery in a couple of weeks um, so that you can recover faster. So you get the surgery done, and then a couple of weeks later, you get the first follow-up uh, scheduled to do some uh, physical therapy and things like this. So this is something that a lot of us can relate to, but how do, do we use this amount of data that is generated in, for every patient at every step of their uh, patient journey to feed back into research projects? And this is what we are trying to do at BMS. I'm part of a team that is called Translational Epidemiology, and we get this wealth of real-world data and bring it back to the researcher. So we try to give our contribution to closing the loop, and I would love to share a little bit more details about what we do there. But before I start, I would like to explain a little bit how I ended up in this role. These are my disclosures. <laughs> And uh, I have one slide about uh, my career path. It's pretty packed, um, but uh, we can go step by step and see what, what happened there. And um, I see my uh, core value or core skills accompanying me step by step being data. So I love data. When I hear the word, I'm super thrilled. And uh, I see data along two axes. One is exposure. So the exposure to the various use cases that you have in the environment where you work, and, and I, I'm a big proponent or, of interdisciplinarity. I think that interdisciplinarity actually shortens the time to innovation. You are able to borrow and lend ideas to the various disciplines where you work. And I think this is a great asset when you work in a, in a field that is evolving and movingly, moving very rapidly. The other axis I see um, is really going more deep into the data expertise. It's one thing to open a table and check the columns that you have there. It's another thing to really understanding the details of how the data was generated and what it actually means. So I tried to match these two axes along my full career path. And I consider my studies as part of my career path because it was during my university studies that I heard for the first time that you should actually include the outliers in your analysis. <laughs> you cannot just remove them. And it was also the first time that I heard actually significance doesn't matter if you don't have an effect size. You also want to know that there is actually something biologically relevant going on. So I spent my uh, university time at the University of Bern and in Uppsala in Sweden. And there I was doing manual analysis using Excel and Prism and simply using the data that was generated in the lab. 
That was a great experience, but quite quickly I realized that it wasn't that scalable. I joined a team in the Institute of Pathology in Bern, and we were analyzing every month the same, uh, the newly generated data, but with the same methods. We were clicking through things and creating new plots, but in the end, we, this was not really like high value type of work. It was manually redoing the same work over and over again. So I started to think about this problem of scalability, and I actually proposed to the team that I was working that we should think about automatizing processes. I mean, if I will do it every month, maybe code can do it for me every month. So I started to dig a bit deeper into these uh, chances of optimizing processes, of sc uh, scaling up processes, and I spent a lot of time with R writing this code to automatize things. It was also during my master thesis that I encountered TCGA for the first time. I had a couple of talks before during the break of some people that have no TCGA, and it's an amazing resource. For me, it was amazing to see that there is so much public data out there that you have zero cost at generating, and you can simply go ahead and analyze. I thought that was fascinating. I spent a little time trying to understand how we manage our data that we generate every month, how we can track the pipelines that have, we have used, the code, how do we version control things. And I did something, I googled it. Um, today I would use ChatGPT, and I'm sure everyone was hoping that this would be a no ChatGPT talk, but I actually will bring it there because I use it a lot. Um, but I found some information online, and this was information related to other industries. We were thinking about data management, but we were not the first ones. There are industries that work with IT and have problems with, or concerns about data management and controlling pipelines since decades. I discovered a program, the trainee program at Swisscom, and I discovered that there was a biologist that was hired a couple years prior to me. So I thought, okay, this is my opportunity to join a different industry and to learn how other industries handle these type of problems. So I joined Swisscom as a trainee and was able to work on three different projects. Every project lasted four months, and it was just enough to understand why we are actually doing that, but it was also uh, enough to actually learn about new data sources and data types. So I had the chance to work on product sales data, on 5G communication data, on imaging data. There is a subsidiary called Swisscom Health, and they work a lot with the EHR system and things like this. So it was a very an enriching experience from the expo exposure perspective, but I wanted to go a little a step more forward on the deepness of the data. So I had the chance to join a team that was actually taking the proof of concept I had developed during, the, during my trainee and expand it to a fully fledged product that was envisioned for a company-wide deployment. Until then, all my experience was based on my laptop and storing the data there and doing not really production-ready code. So for me, it was an amazing experience to actually transition to a team where I knew they wanted to scale that up and really deploy it at large scale for a, product, uh, a productionalization effort. So I joined that team. And I stayed there for six months, but my heart was still beating for biomedical data. In the end, I was still a biologist, and I was still fascinating about all the wealth of data that we have in biology. So that was my chance to join this team at BMS. Uh, the team is called Translational Epidemiology, and I'm a part of the team since almost three years. To summarize my profile, I consider myself a data scientist and a researcher. I love innovation, and I also think that my deepest expertise in data is multimodal real-world data. I think that I am a quick learner because I'm not scared of learning new things. I'm actually thrilled by it, and I think that everything done as a team is much more fun than doing it by yourself. So this is everything to my profile, and I would like to share a little bit more about what I do now at, at the current team. 
So we have seen various versions of these during the previous talks, and this is the typical drug discovery, the drug development pipeline that, that we have. Of course, it's oversimplified, but it should still help you a bit understand what is going on in, in pharma for research and development. So you have a first phase where you have the target identification and target validation. And then you do some more studies, you try to understand how the drug actually is working, and you might do some uh, animal testing, and then at some point you think that the drug is uh, ready to go to clinical studies, and you perform clinical studies for safety and efficacy. Once you have the drug on the market, a lot of regulators actually ask you to do these post-marketing safety and efficacy studies. But in general, we have a wealth of real-world data that is the type of data that is collected in the real world that is being generated. This is what is called observational data because it, you are simply observing what is happening. You are tracking the information that is out there for in the real world. And our effort at core as a team is to take this data and bring it back to the researcher so that we can help support questions in the research early space. So we focus a lot on clinical RWD, real-world data. We have a lot of information on demographics, we have information about longitudinal treatments that patients get, we have information about surgeries and adverse events, but how do we actually use the data in the end? We have a couple of main points, how we leverage the data. So we think that we are able to get a lot of information about the factors that actually influence patients' prognosis. These data also help us and identify new patient populations or new subgroups of highly unmet medical need. Maybe we realize that there is a specific set of population that is actually not responding so well to treatment, and we want to go there to actually be able to find a new drug that will help those patients. We also think that we will have, with the real-world data, a new wealth of uh, hypotheses that are being generated, because sometimes we have, yes, clinical trial, but not for every indication. We don't have it for every therapeutic areas and not every drug. Um, so we actually think that this wealth of data will help us better understand patient populations where we normally don't have data in-house. We don't only focus on clinical data. The core of the team is really focusing on this multimodality aspect. Multimodality means that for one given patient, you don't only have clinical data, but you are also able to complement with additional modalities, whether it is genomics, transcriptomics, imaging, uh, you, we can have histopathological uh, images, but also MRI and wearables. So this helps us better understand some associations between gene disease and protein or um, other characteristic of your cohort. We also think that we are able to use this molecular data to better understand patient stratification. So we know that there are some patients with lung cancer that, depending on their genomic profile, will respond better or worse to a given treatment. We also think that we have a lot of possibilities to generate new insights. We have a lot of data and it's great to be able to apply new machine learning or AI models to actually derive new insights that, that maybe get lost from the human eye. So just to conclude, I think that there is a lot of potential for real-world data in this reverse translational approach in drug development. We see a continuous in growing amount of data available, and we see also a lot of new modalities coming in the space. We have now proteomics, metabolomics, and a wealth of imaging data available. We think that given that we have more and more of this uh, high um, amount of data, high dimensional data, we also have new potential application for machine learning and AI models to be applied on. However, we cannot forget that we will always need experimental work to accompany this type of research. We, it's very difficult to make causal statements about real-world data because you are observing, you are not really influencing a system and then having a readout. And I think this is a beautiful message out here. I think that science is collaborative, and I think we can only achieve and make big steps in science if we 
mix all our expertise and work together on problems. Thank you very much.